You got a question over here? Uh, yeah, obviously, uh, kind of the, a lot of stuff you talked about shows you're not a big fan of it, but what's your response to the Big fan of? The IIFYM, if it's your macros type thing. Yeah. I'm an 80-20 guy. I'm, I'm cool with that. In so much as the decisions that you make don't negatively affect your end goal. I think that IIYFM, whatever it is, I think that that mostly focuses on general health, dieting, you know, losing 10, 20 pounds kind of thing. I think that's more specific for that. When, and I was trying to talk today, pretty close. I was talking today mostly about performance and anything that would detract from that, any food that you would choose that would, would cause you to bloat or, you know, would, would go away from the ultimate goal, I think I would be cautious. I would start to look at the FODMAP and make a choice off of, you know. Yeah. When you apply that to powerlifting, yeah. it immediately becomes IHOP, Subway, uh, you know, <laughs> Chipotle. It, it, it really quickly. And there's a lot of problems with a lot of those foods. I'd just, I'd say, yeah, make a selection, but go back to the FODMAP and make sure it doesn't impede what our ultimate goal is, you know. What you're mentioning is still a better choice than, than not following anything at all. But what he's mentioning is, is a way better choice than... The good, better, best yeah. option, yeah. I, go ahead. What do you recommend for us ladies where my goal is going to be a lot different from where I still want the performance, but I don't want the volume to pass? I know it, and I tell you, I use the same method with a calorie deficit to prepare women to the Olympia level. Uh, bikini, figure, and physique, I've worked with them, and they respond extraordinarily well to replace at the same calorie level, right? You're gonna eat 1,600 a day, you're gonna eat 1,600 a day. Why not get a food that gives you so much more bang for your buck? If you're gonna put an hour in the gym training, why wouldn't you use the kinds of exercise that build the most muscle, burn the most fat, as opposed to BOSU ball sit up, you might be over there doing your prowler pushes and 20 rep squats, right? I'm saying the same things in terms of food for that given hour or for that given calorie uh, ceiling, the 1600 calorie ceiling, wherever yours might be, let's put the kinds of foods in there that, that give you more nutrients rather than less, that, don't, that aren't fed soy, so they raise your estrogen, so they then increase fat storage, uh, such as ground turkey, fed soy, increases estrogen. <laughs> I know that's a common thing. Uh, or egg whites, I mean, how much nutrient is in an egg white, you know? And then to take the egg white and say, well, okay, and I'm going to add a healthy fat to that and pour in a polyunsaturated fatty acid, which is also known to increase estrogen, uh, suppress the thyroid. <laughs> so I'm saying is replace the egg white, replace the white fish with an equivalent amount of calories in steak because you're going to get so much more return on that. Uh, the 10-minute walks is much better than the 40-minute treadmills uh, because you don't break down the muscle tissue, which is so necessary uh, for you in terms of improving your metabolism or reaching the, the level of, uh, you know, the body fat percentage that you want. And uh, the workouts should be more towards building muscle. You're not going to get bulky. That's not the way it works. Uh, but you're going to stimulate a better response in terms of insulin sensitivity, thyroid, calorie consumption by doing you know, the 20 rep squats, the, the, the harder exercises, the multi-joint exercises. Anything more specific than that? Um, also speaking, I don't know, like, do you believe that, I know a lot of these guys are putting on size for strength, because I'm a power lifter. Mm -hmm. So I can't eat more than 2,000 calories and feel good, or look good, yeah. but I still want to be as strong as I can be. Yeah. I guess kind of taking it more than just looking a certain way, still having that same... Let's make those 2,000 calories better. And I'm saying that steak's better than boneless, skinless chicken breast in terms of the kind of nutrients that it provides you. It's the same number of calories, but you're, I think you're going to get more out of it. You're going to see an improvement in performance. I think you're going to see an improvement in body composition from that. And in terms of performance, sodium's a huge deal. And I know that women try and avoid sodium, but it's an enormous benefit for recovery. You may see a few three, four days of compensation whereby you, you may have a little bit of water retention. But within a week, that's gone because your body now sees 
that you're not trying to starve it of sodium anymore, so it's not trying to hold on to it. It becomes really good at, at uh, processing it. Your kidneys can process 30 grams of sodium a day. I'm talking about eating eight. You know, so, and it's going to drastically help with performance. You're going to get in the gym and have more stamina and endurance. You're just going to be able to do more at a higher level with greater intensity and then recover faster so you can get back in maybe with more frequency. And ultimately, that's the goal. I'll tell you one more thing, and we talked a little bit about it. Orange juice or oranges, orange juice I tend to like, in just a small amount, maybe three ounces, a few times a day, has an incredible stimulatory effect on the liver. The liver, when it's happy, 70% uh, of thyroid is converted from T4 to T3 in the liver. Uh, thyroid is ultimately one of your biggest focuses in terms of increasing metabolism. I mentioned the milk, also very good for, for thyroid, for metabolism in general, the calcium. Uh, those things actually stimulate metabolism. It's, it's crazy to you to hear this. I know, it's absolutely crazy. But I'm not asking you to increase your calories. I'm just asking you to look at the calories that you are eating. Which ones cause your body engine to, to rev faster and, and better and more efficiently? And which ones stimulate the hormones that cause uh, an increase in estrogen, fat, con fat storage, etc.? That's kind of how I'm looking at it. And I, I've seen the results are immediate. Within two, three days, they're just ecstatic about this. So oh, I feel so great. My workouts are incredible. I'm like, ah, ah, they're excited about it. So it's worth a try. What's two, three days? What's a week? You know, um, my wife, uh, who I did a rant about her growing up in Samoa, has always struggled with her weight. Um, and when she made these changes, her body composition changed pretty drastically over a relatively short period of time. Stopped doing all the cardio, started lifting for strength. Uh, and then changed the diet away from the boneless, skinless chicken breast onto the steak, and she's made significant changes in her physique. She's never looked back. She's ecstatic about it. So CrossFit's good proof of that as well. CrossFit's an excellent yeah, we had example. A, a female athlete here a few weeks ago, Brooke Ants, and you know she got done with her workout immediately. She was throwing down some steak and a sweet potato, and um, you know she had all her meals with her and everything. And it's like, yeah, it's a real pain in the ass. I eat twenty six hundred calories a day. And she's shredding, you know. And I yeah. know it's just one example, but you look at the girls in CrossFit and you look at some of the girls that have been concentrating on um, performance and not being so focused on aesthetics, a lot of them have ended up with a better physique for it because they've been focusing in on something a little different. And with their, with their food choices, uh, they're not um, so restricted with their food choices, like eating just chicken breast, egg whites, those things. They've shifted gears towards steak. Uh, even like a paleo diet, paleo diet was really popular with CrossFit a while back. I don't know if it still is, but it still has a huge influence over what they eat and some of the uh, meal prep companies uh, that deal with CrossFitters, that promote the CrossFitters, that try to target them. Uh, those companies have uh, meat, potatoes, rice, those kinds of things, all those kind of, all the stuff he's talking about. Why don't you guys do me a favor and remember or write down in your phone or something uh, an article that you can just uh, pull up on the internet and read. Extraordinary article, Dr. Mary Enig, if you haven't heard of her, um, and uh, I think it's uh, Fallow, Oiling of America. Extraordinary article, and it gets beyond just the polyunsaturated fat and the vegetable oil thing as a, um, you know, as a marketing uh, uh, thing for these big companies, but into some of the nutritional aspects of why uh, those oils are so bad for you. And it has a, a, a chronology going back 70 plus years of how it was introduced, where the research was falsified, and, uh, and what we're discovering now, which is a lot of what's in Gary Taub's book, Good Calories, Bad Calories, is disseminating the myth of healthy oils and the benefit of saturated fats and cholesterol. And uh, that's another great book to read, would be, if I didn't mention that one already. Gary Taub's book, Oiling of America. I think it's extraordinary. When you read through that, you'd just be shaking your head that we're actually eating that stuff. And it's in everything. You go to Whole Foods, canola oil. In every one of their products out there to eat, I can't eat there because I'm allergic to it, so I'm particularly offended by it. Uh, but soybean oil, I mean, there was, soybeans was probably, in the 19, 1900, almost no production of that. Uh, now, or by 1970, I think, 700 million tons a year of soybean 
oil coming in the United States. It's in almost everything. It's like 70% of our foods. And it's used to cook in that and canola oil. Uh, I don't mean to go on and on about it, but boy, I'll tell you, that's, that's some nasty poison. Go ahead. There's been uh, every product out there for like, you know, pre-workout stuff like that. Um, yeah. A lot of stuff on nitric oxide. Have you ever done a lot yeah. of research on that? And would that ever be worth the I've, I've done a bit. And examine.com is a great resource that talks about it. And it does see some benefit with nitric oxide in terms of uh, increasing blood flow, et cetera. Uh, I found that with increasing sodium, I experienced a lot of those benefits anyhow because it increases blood volume, uh, which then makes your blood flow a little easier. Uh, it helps you get, uh, improve your red blood cell uh, distribution through the body. You know, your lungs you know, get oxygenated and your blood flow is better and easier. That's part of the benefit of with the endurance and stamina from sodium intake. Another thing like creatine. A lot of people presume to think initially that creatine's benefit was the ATP cycle. Uh, denosin triphosphate breaks down into denosin diphosphate. And it needs another phosphate, right? So creatine monohydrate breaks down into creatine phosphate, and it gleans it from that and makes its ATP, and you're off and running, right? Well, then they figured out, well, maybe that's not really how it works. And now the supposition is, is that it's just intracellular water retention. Well, another way to get that is through adequate sodium, water, and glycogen intake, right? And so when you start eating cor what I think is correctly, suddenly a lot of these supplements don't have nearly as much benefit. When you remedy a deficiency, performance improves, right? And that's true with vitamin D, that's true with glycogen, that's true with sodium. Uh, and maybe creatine was just kind of remedying that deficiency, but I don't see an increased performance in athletes who are already getting adequate, uh, like with Hofthor or Larry, that might even cause a problem because there's some cramping involved, potentially. If you're deficient, creatine tends to work for those people. If you're hydrated, it tends not to work for those people. That's the difference. So as far as uh, what I mentioned about getting adequate sodium and calcium in, that is another way to improve blood flow and um, blood vessel elasticity. And so maybe some of those supplements wouldn't be as effective with those people. But examine.com does go into great detail on that. They're very good and, and unbiased. Uh, I don't know if you've worked with those people or talked to those people before. There really hasn't been much research to show that any supplement does really anything. Doesn't do a whole lot. The stuff I'm talking about today, the very simple things I talked about today, can make huge differences in one week. Uh, a lot of these supplements, they're, if, you're, if you're deficient, if you're inadequate in some area, you might see a benefit. Yeah. And for some people, it might come earlier than others. Uh, somebody might come in here and, and lift here for three months and deadlift 700 pounds, while somebody else, you know, has to chase that down their entire life and do any and everything. Yeah, possible. genetics reigns supreme. <laughs> I, I can't beat that one today. Sorry. Life is, but that's what's that's what's great about this is it's is it's hard and it will always be hard. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you've been doing it for 30 years or not. Go ahead. Milk was a good one for me. Eggs, not a good one for me. Those are inexpensive and still provide a, and then having uh, meal prep. Make sure you got what you need when you need it. Costco. Yeah. The, the body doesn't work in peaks like that. You don't get strong from a huge workout. You get strong from stringing together a series of workouts consistently. Uh, when the body needs protein, it needs what it needs when it needs it. It doesn't need <laughs> this up here. Same thing's true with a lot of these people with these drug cycles. You know, it doesn't need 5,000 on, uh, uh, on your blood test and testosterone levels. It needs about, you know, 1,000 or 1,200. <laughs> it just needs what it needs when it needs it. You're not going to build it any faster. There's a, a process, you know, and it just takes consistency. So always have that available. It was one of the things in college that I always did was was go in and, and prep my meals for the day uh, in the student lounge in the morning. And same thing if you've ever seen some of my snippets from when I travel, I carry a bag that's just full of food. And when I had to fly to the UK, I had six meals in there, you know, to get me through. And I'm thinking to myself as I'm eating breakfast, okay, I'm gonna have to eat one more flight before I get on the, pl or one more meal before I get on the plane. And then every about two and a half or three hours thereafter, and then when I land, because it's gonna take me a while to get my car and get to where I'm gonna go, and I map that out, and I go, that's how many meals I need. 
along with a couple of this, that, and the others, and that's what I prepped for. So, and that's what I did with Hofthor, too. He was traveling. HBO was sending him all over the world. Red-eye flights, landing at hotels with no kitchenette, no food there for him. So part of it, a big part of what I did with Hofthor was, was just uh, you know, time management, just uh, um, planning ahead. I, I had his, his manager and his uh, girlfriend work on getting all of that orchestrated so he would fly during the day. He would land at a hotel that had a kitchenette or at least a fridge and a microwave. Uh, and he would have meals waiting for him there. There was a meal prep company at the Arnold. I flew out a week earlier when he was there and went to Costco and bought all the meats. It was 20 degrees and snowing and I was outside at the barbecue at the hotel cooking up steak, pounds and pounds of steak, and uh, you know, took him over and fed it to him uh, that whole week for his performance. That's a huge deal. And I think that Brian Shaw said when he goes to Africa to compete in the World's Strongest Man, he flies all his food there and his water because you don't want to drink, you, know, you don't know. Yeah, and one year everybody got sick and he ended up kicking, kicking everybody's butt. He counts on that. He <laughs> counts on the fact that probably 40, 50 percent of the guys will not perform at their best at that show because they'll get there late and, be, uh, and have jet lag, uh, not enough sleep. Then they'll go out and eat something. Next thing you know, they're pissing out their ass. They lost 10 pounds. <laughs> and they're in there trying to compete. And, and he's just fat and happy with all his prepared meals and just smashing people. He counts on that, on that lack of planning. So, and that's a huge component here. As I talk about all this, it really does take some discipline and planning to get the sleep in, to get all the meals in, you know, the preparedness. Uh, it's important. Who was back here? The question. Yeah, uh, but before that, real quick, uh, how have you been able to reach some of your goals? Because a lot of us have goals. A lot of us will, you know, set stuff out. Did you write stuff down? Uh, did you, as you're talking about all this planning, I know you do some uh, things that most people would think are, are weird. Like I know you go to like Target or Walmart and you pick up a. Uh, ice chest, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's like 15 bucks, and you bring it to, the, and you stay yeah. an extended stay every time, yeah. a place where you can cook. What are some of the things that you did? How did you, how did you match up, I guess, your goal with, with all the shit? Well, that, that was part did. of what I said here about the logistics and the whole planning of the whole thing. I knew what my goal was and where I had to be and when, and so I would make sure that I had everything prepared. And oftentimes, my travel places, I'll land, and, and the first thing I'll do is go to Walmart and grab one of those big rolling coolers, and then get all my food and put it in there and make sure I've got everything I need, whatever I couldn't bring with me. When I flew to Samoa for a week to do uh, seminars at the high schools there, I, t I brought a, a Tupperware or a, a, a rolling cooler that I'd duct taped shut and inside of it I had over 40 pounds of steak and it, on ice and so when I got there I just barbecued it all week because I knew that the island didn't have that quality of meat. There's really fatty pig and uh, the meats are really, really fatty. Uh, so you know, I planned. <coughs> to me, this is all mapped out. I, s I see people, goals, yeah, goals, kind of that's a big thing, I think, when you've got your goals, is to, and then the, the path to get there. Um, I see so often, and it's frustrating to me because we never really did this, <laughs> that people will spend an hour talking about their, uh, their prep for their next meet, every rep, every set, Every percentage of here, you're going to do 65% uh, for a three by three, and then a two by two with 50%, and then a, you know, it's maddening to me that they'll spend that much time on something like that. And of course, when I watch it in a seminar, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah. And I, I guess if you know, a plan's a plan, but it pales in comparison to these very simple, seemingly boring, monotonous things that I talk about. Like, Stan sat up here and talked for an hour about sleep, and but that's a hundred times more important than, than your 65% of your one map <laughs> rep max for a three by three. Uh, it, it just is. I found that when I did these things and I went to the gym, I could do anything I wanted. I didn't care what percentage it was of what. You know, I came to the gym every single week and outperformed the last week because of the things I did outside the gym and recovery. And all the guys in the gym follow me. I said, Stan, Stan, what are you doing? What are you, what, Stan, Stan, what are you, you know? It's always, what are you taking? You know, I always want to know that. I wish that were the secret. You know, I went to every guru in the business and asked that question and discovered everybody's doing the same thing. You know, and the ones that are succeeding either have a, a genetic predisposition or they're putting in a lot of, of the, doing the basics really well. You know.
Yeah, you know, and I tried a little bit of that. One of the problems is, is you, you can only grow as fast as you can grow, right? And uh, insulin just shuttles more calories in you, and whether or not your body utilizes those, uh, or you even need it because of some of the tricks and techniques that I just talked about uh, as to your post-workout carbs. It's really what insulin's trying to do is the same thing we try to do with our post-workout carb sodium and, and caffeine drink is trying to shuttle as much carbohydrates in, into the muscle as possible, as quickly as possible. That's what it's really trying to do. Uh, and if we found a way to do it without it, then we don't have to worry about its effect on the pancreas and, and maybe shutting it down and becoming diabetic, et cetera. Uh, I've known a lot of people over the years who've done a lot of it, uh, and a lot of people over the years have done none. And there doesn't seem to be a huge difference between the two, except for the people who do a lot of it tend to end up with an enormous belly because the vast majority of those insulin receptors are on your large intestine, and that's what grows. <laughs> you know, the carbohydrates in and of themselves, look at Ronnie Coleman. I mean, there's a perfect example. You know, he looks pregnant from a lot of the insulin use, uh, uh, and a lot of the, the calories, the carbohydrates. It's one of the drawbacks with an enormous amount of carbs is that a lot of those receptors are on, on your uh, large intestine. And uh, the voracious eaters, Kai Green is another example, uh, there are, you know, there's adverse effects to that. Uh, if you do it, it would be, I've always found that you can get an, an amazing result from much, much less than what most people would suggest. And fortunately, I learned that from Flex Wheeler early in, because as Dorian Yates talked about back in the late 80s and early 90s, everybody thought when you went from one cc a test to two cc's a test, that, that was a huge deal, and you were going to shit a liver, and you were going to, you know, die. And, but Nowadays, that's like Monday. You know, two seasons of tests is like Monday. Nowadays, when you look at the industry and the, the crazy things that people have, have been doing out there. And I've found, particularly in the last five years, uh, like we just talked about today with our blood tests, I just got mine back and my, my testosterone was 970 something. And the month before that, it was 750. And the month before that, it was like 1200. It moves around a little bit, but it's not 3000 or 5000 like some of the guys try and maintain today. And I'm not missing much to be. You know, I'm just finding that my performance hasn't suffered really any other than the fact that I'm just a little bit older. Um, you know, I don't think you need to use a lot of it. I think that it's consistency and discipline, et cetera, um, to put a number on it. Uh, and probably maybe five I use post-workout with your 100 grams of carbs. And that would really only be the, t be the only time I'd recommend it, although some people recommend pre-workout, uh, because if you take it at a different time of day and you don't have the, uh, the muscles aren't drained of, of glycogen, then where's that glycogen going to go? It's going to go to fat storage. So I would also say, like, take it for what? You know, like, what's, what's the goal? Um, it's, it's such a dangerous drug. I mean, people die from it. Dallas McCarver is no longer alive at 26 years old. Great bodybuilder. But what a tragic story it ends up being uh, just because he wanted to be a little bit bigger. And you start to kind of look at it that way, you're like, oh, that's pretty fucking stupid. And I, you know, I've talked to these, I know these people personally. I've talked to all of them. I, you know, I guest posed with Dallas uh, just some months back at the Emerald Cup. Uh, I've talked to them, and they're very forward, you know. But usually whatever they tell you, you've got to multiply it by two. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I've, and I know a lot of these pros and have for many, many, many years. I know some of them take a lot more than that every single day all you know and I know some of them are diabetic as a result so it happens one of the problems is when you ask me a question I give you the answer is is that if I don't give you an answer then you're left to try and you know guess from whatever you get on the internet I reached out when I was a young man trying to find out information and I was fortunate that people would share that information with me so I wasn't left just to kind of try and figure it out because you shouldn't experiment particularly with something like that it can be dangerous I don't want to you know over exaggerate it if I use an insulin post-workout with some carbs, you know, it, can be, it can enhance performance a little bit. Sure, maybe. Uh, but possibly only if you aren't doing the things that you could be doing, like the recommendations that we've made in terms of my vertical dieting and the, uh, the white rice and the post-workout carb drink with sodium. If you're doing that, you might not see much benefit from it at all. You might do, do what I suggested uh, uh, and, and get everything out of that. So... And it's not a huge strength thing anyhow. It really isn't. It's like GH. It's never a really big strength thing. Um, 
uh, what's his name? Um, Ronnie Coleman talked about that as well. He was just about as strong before all of that um, as he was after yeah, all of that. I mean, it'll, it'll make your body bigger, which in turn will make you stronger. Uh, it doesn't necessarily just turn on all these hormones and genes to make you stronger. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't really do a lot for your central nervous system, which is part of what makes you strong in the first place. It, you can't replace the training that you're doing. It can only, uh, it can only help amplify it, really. Yeah. Question? Uh, topic of nutrition, what would you recommend or what's worked for you for like meat day nutrition like during the powerlifting week? Uh, that's great. I, the biggest thing is I don't introduce any foods that I haven't been eating already. I don't want to confuse the gut at that point. Uh, another thing is, is the hydration, to make sure that I'm getting plenty of carbs, plenty of salt. And I don't do a lot of sugar. Now, when people do a weight cut and immediately coming off the scale, I give them that drink. 30 minutes later, I give them another one. After that, no more sugar for the refeed. Stay away from that. It stimulates the kidneys to release water. Next thing you know, you're pissing every five minutes. You start dehydrating, cramping. So you want to avoid that. And I've been there. This is from experience. <laughs> And I've worked with athletes who have been there and helped them not be there. Larry cramped up at a meeting at a meet so bad that he wasn't going to be able to bench after his squat. That that? Yep. Yep. And, and it's just, like an <laughs> yeah. And that's, uh, you know, he was weight cutting. Unfortunately, he's not going to do that anymore. I, I suggested at his last meeting not, and he ended up cramping again. Uh, got off the scale, went to IHOP and just pounded down a whole bunch of calories and, and your body couldn't handle that drank a bunch, of, ate a bunch of sugar stuff. So I eat stuff that I've been eating. The, the white rice is one of my favorite, a little bit of dextrose maybe, to, um, but not too much sugar. A lot of people start snacking all kinds of, you know, whatever. But I also felt when I got hydrated, I was stronger. Intracellular water retention, I felt like a BOSU ball. I purposely did get kind of bloated, you know. I'd get on the weight scale and I'd have a six pack and then you'd see me with my belt on under the squat rack the next day, and that thing would be hanging out like this. I'd just, <laughs> I'd walk in doing warm-ups kind of, I, I, I ate probably an hour before I started warming up. And I ate in between every lift because I wanted to stay and, you know, hydrated. Um, Nun tablets was, was helpful. Uh, just however you can, pickles, bacon for breakfast. The focus is on carbs, salt, and water. So I'm going to say that. White rice, sodium, and water. Those three things are the major component. You don't need at that point a whole lot of protein or a whole lot of fat. It's not, you know, something to satiate you, something you typically ate. Uh, at the proteins that you do eat at that point, I try and pull in a little bit, a couple pieces of bacon because of the salt. And I will have made sure to eat a couple pieces of bacon a few weeks prior uh, as needed, so I'm assimilated to it. So those are the big three for coming to a meat full, hydrated, so that when you're lifting, it's just everything feels explosive. On that same note, I feel that way too many people diet down for their competitions, and you're always going to be better off being bigger for your competition rather than smaller every single time. So if you're five pounds away, six pounds away, even if you're just a couple pounds away, just, just stay heavier until you're more comfortable with the sport. Wait until you're doing the sport for a little while to if you're going to do any sort of like weight cut. There's really not a big reason to do a weight cut unless, um, unless you start performing at a more competitive level. You start moving up the ladder a little bit and it looks like, oh man, okay, I can get like a state record or I can get a, a national record. I can get an all-time record. Then it starts to kind of make a little bit more sense. But even in those cases, you'll always be stronger. Uh, powerlifting is, is not about, <laughs> it's not about getting smaller. It's about getting, getting bigger. And you want to try to fill yourself up with as much as you can as you get closer to the contest. I would see Stan sporadically sometimes because he didn't, he never lived out here in California, um, although he relocated for a little bit to train with us, um, just uh, staying at an extended stay. But when he was, when he was here, you know, I'd kind of see before my very eyes him getting a little bigger, but then if he, he had to go back to, I think at the time, actually he lived in Washington, right? Mm. He'd go back to Washington, and he'd come back uh, three or four weeks later and go, oh my God, what the hell happened? And he, he would just get so damn big going into the competition. But as he was pointing out earlier, everything was ramping up. And he, <laughs> I asked him at one point if I could look at his, uh, I was like, hey, I was like, I, I was like, you need the, he has like a spreadsheet that had everything on it. I was like, I need to see that spreadsheet. I want to I put that in Power Magazine when I have you in the cover. He's like, 
He's like, there'd be a lot of stuff uh, blacked out. <laughs> there'd be a lot of shit that'd be blacked out on there. But it had all his food. It had the weights he wanted to hit. It had how much he wanted to weigh. It's everything mapped out as he was going, moving along, as he was gaining weight, the volume, the intensity, everything else was increasing as well. Yeah, hours of sleep, meals, supplements, everything, you know, by supplements, I mean vitamin D, calcium. And in addition to whatever, you know, I was using at the time, I monitored that and got monthly blood tests to see if, you know, I was able to do that effectively and uh, efficiently. So, you didn't yeah. even know everything you know now. No, and it's a, it was a whole spreadsheet. It was on a, it was on a, uh, I had the days of the month across the top and down the side was every single thing, including my daily carrot, you know, my vitamin D intake. My body weight, you know, and again, what, what my, like I didn't map out my training to such a, a specific degree. I just put my big numbers on there that I wanted to hit at that yeah, training that session. Made any sense. He would tell me what they were, and I was like, I don't know. <laughs> once, once I got to know him, once I got to see him lift, then there's no reason to ever count him out from anything. So once he told me, I was like, yeah, that's probably going to happen, but it doesn't make any sense. He would be like, I'm going to do... So here's what I thought I was going to do. 755 for a triple this week in the squat. Next week, I'll go to 850 for a double. And I'm like, you just jumped 50 pounds. <laughs> you only reduced one rep. One rep doesn't equal that much of a percentage. And then he'd be like, yeah, I'll do the 850. And the next week, you know, I'll cut the volume down. And I'll just do 875 for a single. And then the following week, be 905. He's like, because you can't just do 900. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> Okay, you know, that's the, that sounds like the plan. That's what we'll, that's what we'll do, and that's what happened. Yeah. <laughs> he made it work. Any other questions? Well, I know you're talking about vegetables, but as far as fruit, you mentioned oranges. Why, why that one in particular? Uh, well, because it's easy to digest. It's on my uh, FODMAP menu, and it just tends to be good on my stomach good fiber, vitamin C. Uh, it's a great stimulant, the fructose for the liver. Uh, and I also found that um, some other fruits might not have as much benefit, watermelon or something. And something like bananas can uh, affect digestion, leaky gut, persorption. Some of that uh, indigestible starch may get into the bloodstream. And just little things, little quirks I have from some of the research that I've done and my experience with when I eat them, how do I feel? Not too much, you know, I, just enough to get the benefits out of it, but I'm concerned about the bloating uh, problem that's associated with too much fiber and also <coughs> impeding protein absorption, binding to minerals and electrolytes, that's what it does. There's, some folks go overboard, the fiber, uh, what's the name of that book? Uh, the uh, Fiber Menace is a book that gets into great detail about uh, problems that you can have uh, when you do too much vegetables, particularly uncooked um, vegetables. So I think they're important in so much as they can benefit you and then you have to be careful that a lot of those have uh, uh, can have caused digestion problems. I've shared this story a couple times but we'll kind of end with this. Um, <coughs> when Stan came to my gym years ago and he started training with me we basically became training partners from that, that point on. Uh, that's kind of what he told me uh, as we sat down at lunch one day and he slid a giant bundle of cash across the table and said, I want you to train me. I want to break world records. When we started working together and I started training him, uh, I quickly realized I was outmatched. Like, damn, man, this guy. And I'm like, okay, he's killing me in the squats and deadlifts, but I'm a good bencher, so I can at least make up some ground there. I was wrong with that as well. Sometimes you're just going to run into somebody that's a buzzsaw. Sometimes you're just going to run into somebody that, for whatever reason, they're just better than you on certain things. And for me, that was hard to swallow. I normally, under normal circumstances, was usually the strongest person in the gym. Although I did pride myself in bringing a few other people up to be able to beat me on a squat, be able to beat me on a bench, and eventually uh, beat me on, on a deadlift as well. That was okay because I had the highest total in the gym. So I was still pretty comfortable with it. But as he, as he and I started to train together more and more, I was like, man, there ain't shit I can beat him on. I tried to beat him on, I don't know, a set of lap pull downs or whatever it was, and I, I couldn't catch him on anything. And I'm like, I'm really good with dumbbells. I'm like, I can do the 150s for like 15 or 20 reps. Well, then he takes our 215-pound dumbbells, which have not been touched pretty much since uh, he trained with us. 
and he pumped him out for like 10 reps on incline or whatever it was. So I'm like, shit, he's got me there too. <laughs> so one day we were about to squat and I was like, okay, he's pretty, he's pretty new to powerlifting relatively, even though he started doing powerlifting when he was young. Um, but he, he's never used some of the stuff that we have. We have bands, we have chains, we have different barbells. And so I was like, I'm gonna have him do a box squat because I know that he's never done a box squat. We're gonna use bands today because I know that he's never used bands. We're gonna do the safety squat bar because I know that he's never done the safety squat bar before. So he's like, Biggs, what are we doing? And I'm like, oh, don't worry about it. I don't even tell him what we're doing. <laughs> and he walks in and as he's asking me these questions, he turns back around and I'm going bam, bam, bam. I'm smashing these weights and he's like, oh shit, you know, somebody ate their Wheaties today. I'm all excited. I'm going to kick his ass on this day, right? So we start loading up the weight and uh, one plate, two plates. He's moving around like he's 100 years old. He's kind of moving slow. And he's like, ah, you know, and he's making his little, his little bat bat noises that he makes all the time <laughs> when he's lifting. And we start to progress. We start to get a little bit more weight on there. I think at this point we have about 400 pounds of bar weight and we have two bands on each side, which is adding an additional 200 pounds or so. So it's starting to get heavy, about 600 pounds at the top. I go to do my set and I do a double pretty good. Stan goes to do his set, he moves kind of slow and I'm like, all right, here we go, today's the day. I'm not even gonna ask or say anything. I'm not gonna give him a chance to put on a quarter, we're just gonna put on a plate and that'll be that, you know? So I, I put the plate on there. I go and do my set and sure enough, I slowed down a lot because now it's starting to get really heavy. Didn't you put on your squat pants? <laughs> I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> Stan, gets, Stan gets underneath the bar. He wiggles into it. He pushes the bar up a little bit. He gets in his stance. He goes down in super slow motion. I always thought that he was going to like be frozen and turn into concrete because his squats took so fucking long. <laughs> you could eat a sandwich and read the newspaper by the time he was done with the eccentric portion of the squat. I'm watching him go and he's making all his little noises and stuff and he gets to the box and he goes bat, 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 and he goes boom and he explodes off the box. Brings the weight down again and boom, he explodes off the box and he's like, all right Biggs, he's like, I think I got that bar figured out. <laughs> <laughs> so then it gets worse. And then he puts a plate on and I'm like, oh shit. So I go and put my, my squat suit on. Those of you who haven't seen a squat suit before. A squat suit allows you to lift more weight and kind of act like a slingshot for your lower body. So I throw on a squat suit and I'm trying to battle it out with him whatever way I can. And he still kicks my ass. I think he did seven plates for a double and I did six plates with my equipment on and still couldn't hang. So anyway, it's been a long history of him kicking the shit out of me. I don't know why I continue to invite him <laughs> here other than I, I think that uh, by getting my own ass kicked, I think it uh, humbles me and it, it sets me off in the right direction. Uh, we've had many lifters come here through over the years. We've had Ed Cohn, we've had Eric Spoto, and a lot of these guys have kicked the crap out of me. And if you're the best guy in your gym, and if you're the best guy doing what you're doing in the area that you're in, fucking stop doing that. Try to find a greater challenge. Pray for a greater challenge. Try to find people that will uplift you. Try to find people that will take you to the next level. Stan has always been somebody that has helped me rise to the next level. Try to find like-minded people in your area. If they're not in your area, fucking go somewhere else. It's really, really important. What we've built here at Super Training Gym is getting together like-minded individuals that want to get better. Everyone here has the same goal. Everyone just wants to be better than they were yesterday. Try to surround yourself with other people that have a similar mindset. Your life will be that much easier. You don't have to always be fired up 24 seven. Stan is somebody who's got a lot of internal motivation. A lot of people don't have that. A lot of people aren't fortunate. A lot of people come from shitty backgrounds and shitty upbringings and have shitty stuff going on in their lives. But if you get around people that can pick you up and you get rid of the scumbags that are in your <coughs> life and you surround yourself with like-minded people that want to be better on a daily basis, then you don't have to pick up all the slack all the time yourself. That's the entire reason why Super Training Gym was, in, in, was created in the first place because I knew that I wasn't going to be able to have that much energy every single day to kick the world in the dick. Guys, Stan and Ryan O'Leffernick, thank you very much.
We'll be around for a little bit if you want pictures or whatever the hell it is you guys want. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.